welcome everybody. The uh, the queue of people in the waiting room seems to have uh, subsided, so I think we'll get going. My name is Neville Elstone. I'm the director of Cumbria Woodlands. Uh, Cumbria Woodlands is a not-for-profit, and this year is our thirtieth birthday. So that's pretty exciting. Um, we invited people here today with um, no formal agenda, really. Well, some topics, some themes, but really wanted to just open the floor to people. And excuse me, I'm trying to do two things at once and hear people's reflections on the storm. So the three themes that I want, no, the four themes that I wanted to touch on today were the impact. So to try and glean from people um, what the impact was in their area, on their trees, on their woodlands, and spend maybe 10 minutes trying to get people's reflections on that. I then wanted to reflect on safety um, and hear people's views on safety, both in terms of for the public and in terms of contractor safety as well, because I think both e e issues are really, really important. I then wanted to touch on uh, reg stuff. So how does this sit with regulations? And we have some guidance on that that might we have to share. Uh, and there may well also be views from the, the room that want to expand on that a bit. And then really to look at what's next. So what are the next steps for your woodland? What are the next steps in terms of Cumbria and response, really, I think? Uh, I had a couple of just formalities to go through. So the first one was please do use the chat function. Um, some of my colleagues are keeping an eye on the chat, chat function and I'm trying to do that as well. There are, I think, best part of a, now there's 60 of us today. So um, there's quite a lot of us to keep a, uh, an eye on and it would be great if we had some kind of structure to this. So please use the hand raise function or use the chat if you have a question or a comment. We are recording this because I know several people weren't able to make it and were keen to hear people's views and reflections. So um, if you don't want to be um, recorded, then perhaps you'd want to uh, switch your camera off. You know, Monty. And that's... You've got your camera off, haven't you? I'll just mute somebody. Right. That's pretty much all I wanted to do as an, a way of introduction. I wanted to go into the first theme of impacts and just hear from people. But before I did that, I wanted to uh, I wanted to introduce, I guess, an old friend, an old friend of the uh, organisation. So our previous director, Edward Mills. Um, and why did I want to bring Edward in? Well. Um, Good question. Yeah. Very good question, Ed. <laughs> He's old and quite wise. <laughs> and um, Ed worked through um, the last big blow in Cumbria, which was 2005. And it would, so the reason I ask Ed to come along, and also Ed owns and manages um, a couple of woodlands in the South, well, quite a lot of woodlands he manages in the South Lakes. And I wanted to hear what happened to those, and then reflections on the 2005 storm. So that was my reason for asking, Ed, and it kind of just seemed fitting for the 30th year as well. So I'm going to hand over to Ed, and uh, we'll see where we go after that. So thanks ever so much, Ed. Thanks, Neville. Can you hear me okay? Yep, hear you loud and clear. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks for asking me to uh, to talk, and I'm sorry if it sounds a bit echoey. I'm in the warmest room in the house, which is a <clears throat> a barn conversion, um, and lovely to see such a lot of uh, familiar faces. Faces, and um, happy to see some unfamiliar faces as well. Uh, so I, my presentation isn't really a presentation; it's just a a brain dump of, of thoughts, really. I'm afraid, um, and. I, after the initial you know, reports came on the news that there was lots of damage, I did cast my mind back to 2005 uh, and remembered <clears throat> you know, how much effort we, we put as an organization into trying to help people think through the processes of what do we do? What do we do now? We've got 
hundreds, thousands of trees on the ground and what do we do now? So in 2005, that was before storms were named, in fact. So that was just uh, any old low pressure. Um, but the wind speeds then, the highest wind speed was 102 miles an hour. Um, uh, they, the experts think that the, that storm felled half a million trees in 10 minutes. So that's 800 trees a second, they thought, were being blown over at the height of that particular storm. And there were 200 hectares on the Forestry Commission estate alone, which, uh, which were blown over, and they think they cost about half a million pounds to, uh, 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 to make safe and to clear up. So, uh, and, and at the time, we, um, I think we managed to get some funding, some extra funding to lay on, some, some courses to help people uh, deal with what had gone on. I think we had, we had a conference with 100 people at Newton Rig, I think. Uh, and we helped people, we helped contractors upgrade their uh, uh, chainsaw certificates and make sure that they were wake, working safely with the large trees and the wind blow tickets at the time. So we, we did put quite a lot of effort into, into helping people think this through. Um, so, you know, I'm really grateful for, for Neville and team for putting this on because I think uh, we're in the same situation now and these things do need thinking through. And of course, I am also old enough to have uh, worked through the 1987 great storm in, in the southeast of England as well. And we shouldn't forget that there were some uh, lessons there that we should learn as well. But we'll maybe we'll come back uh, a bit to lessons learned a bit later on. So where are we with Storm Arwen then? Uh, I've been doing a bit of driving around in the last, uh, well, this week really, um, uh, looking at clients' woods and looking at my own, my own couple of woods. Um, the highest wind speed uh, they think was 98 miles an hour, but that was in Northumberland. Um, I've got a weather station here, but it was blown over at 35 miles an hour. So that's, that's not much help really. I think the wind speeds were much higher than 35. I wouldn't be at all surprised if there were if, if there were wind speeds of 70 or 80 miles an hour probably recorded in, in, in Cumbria. Uh, so, you know, I think my initial reactions are the same as everybody's reactions, really. Um, sadness and shock at what's happened, a lot of despair. Uh, and then you immediately get to thinking, oh, no, I've got to clear up and what can I do? Uh, there's a little uh, thread on Facebook that, where I showed a picture of our woodland with lots of severe wind blow. And somebody said, how awful. And then, when are you going to replant? And I thought, oh, crikey, just hang on a minute. <laughs> That's, I haven't even thought through how I'm going to take the tree off the, off the damaged gate yet, let alone replanting anything. So, as I say, I've been driving around a lot. Uh, it, the, the, the storm damage seems very, very patchy. There are some woods which seem to be completely unscathed, even some fairly exposed woods which you would expect to have some wind damage and they seem to be okay. Uh, there are uh, equally, there are lots of woods which are, have suffered incredibly severe damage, almost to the point of catastrophic damage, I would say. There are one or two woods where, which are almost completely flat, mostly conifer woods but not exclusively, there's some really bad damage in uh, some broadleaf woodlands. It seems to be uh, often on the northern edge. This was a northerly gale. The gale in 2005 was uh, a westerly gale. And, you know, our woodlands are pretty used to westerly gales, aren't they? We get a lot of them, but northerly gales are really, really unusual and uncommon. Um, uh, and I don't know when the last northerly gale was. Colleagues in Aberdeenshire say that they haven't had a northerly storm like that since the 1950s. Uh, and there are woodlands there that are absolutely flat on the ground completely. So, so here the damage is patchy, but where it's bad, it's, it's, it's very bad. Um, particularly along the lake sides, I would say, around Coniston Water and Windermere and Estherwaite Water. Um, and where where the woods are on, you know, very dry, rocky knolls where the soils are thin. You know, once you let the wind into a wood and you get one edge tree go over, then it sort of telegraphs itself into the into the uh, fairly deeply into the wood. Um, so yeah, that, I think that's all that I'd like to say at the moment. I, as I say, I'm grateful for Cumbria Woodlands for putting this on. I think it's really important to think through the processes, not to panic. 
uh, and make sure that we tackle things in a, in a safe way because um, I've already seen people using chainsaws without any protective gear on uh, and that kind of fills me with horror really. Uh, so I'll no doubt uh, come back a bit later and say a few more things, but thanks very much. Excellent. Thanks ever so much, Ed. Some wise reflections there. And I don't know why, but I'd forgotten that you're a Royal Fellow of, a fellow of the Royal Society of Meteorological Stuff as well. <laughs> so uh, we've got some data as well. Yeah. So that's really good. I thought there were some really interesting reflections on the response by the sector then, and also damage locally and picked out some of the key themes about stop, think, and especially around safety stuff. So that kind of reinforces our thinking, which is reassuring. And my first topic, really, that I'd like us to just kick around for 10 or 15 minutes is people's reflections on damage within their woodlands, or in fact, maybe not even just damage within woodlands, because um, trees outside woodlands parkland trees uh, very very important so um, if anybody wants to um, come in and comment then I'm very happy for them to do so Paul feel free to uh, um you should be able to uh, I'll you need to unmute mute yourself Paul I think you put there you go. cool so well, did, did you and I speak to Dame Neville Yes, I think we did, yes. Yeah. But perhaps you'd like to just share your experience. Oh, yeah. I mean, um, I live next to a woodland that I've um, enjoyed for about 12 years. Um, and I've, I've always coveted the woodland. And about three weeks ago, um, the purchase was uh, final. And um, I, actually, I actually bought the woodland after looking at it for 12 years. Uh, and during that time, the, the, the 10 acre site was uh, every tree and it was standing and it was immaculate. And then just as luck would have it, as soon as I bought it, it's uh, flattened. Um, there's probably four or five acres of it just lying on the ground. And I'm, I'm absolutely devastated. I mean, in, in the two weeks or, or a week or whatever it is since I've had it, I've lost half a stone. Um, and I'm only 10 stone. I'm only a little guy. And um, I've I just, I, it's knocked me for six. I've never had a feeling like it. I mean, I just feel like I've done something evil to deserve it. You know, it's it's devastating. There's oaks, there's beech, there's conifer trees and sycamores and cherries. And they just, it seems to be all of the good hardwood, which has upset me. But um, it's just, I, I can't describe, I mean, everybody else is in the same boat that, that's, that's listening, but all the brash and branches and, bits and pieces that have just exploded everywhere and I've tidied up as good as I can and I haven't scratched the surface. It's just, it, it's it's horrible. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm sure you're going to touch on, touch on this throughout the hour, but I've, I've cleared two big trees that fell across a small lane which uh, comes up to the site and um, I've also cleared a, a tree today which had fallen across a bridle way. And ultimately, that's my story. I mean, I just don't know where to turn. Um, I, I, I'm really, I was really in a position where I wanted everybody to be invited to enjoy the wood. Um, I'm very ecologically minded. I wanted to, to share the, the beauty and the nature and to encourage people to use it and even thought of inviting schools and disabled people or whatever it took just to try and invite people to appreciate nature more. And, I've just literally, pardon the pun, had, had the wind knocked out of my sails. It's, it's horrible. Mm. And that's me. Okay. Thanks ever so much for sharing that experience with us, Paul. I'm right in saying that so you've got sort of nine acres near yeah. Alderson. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. you've lost, what, 50% of it, something like that? Well, maybe maybe not 50%, but okay. I, I've, I've certainly lost a very high proportion of the, of the solid wood. Okay. Um, yeah. Right. Thanks ever so much, Paul. Um, Luke's got his hand up, so uh, I'll go to Luke. Yeah. Uh, can everyone hear me? I'm, I'm actually being driven at the moment, so I apologise if my sound's a bit dodgy. Um, so I help um, manage a woodland uh, in the north of Cumbria, um, and from uh, sort of 
Saturday morning, um, getting reports from members of the public or friends and uh, colleagues to say where, where was badly damaged. And um, I mean, I was similar to yourself, Paul, um, pretty upset about some of the stuff. Um, the in interesting thing for me is there's a, a woodland that we walk in every day with the dog. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a single Scots pine in this large woodland, major majority of it large woodlands. Um, and uh, that was on the ground. Um, and I, I don't, you know, but I had a bit of a, bit of a cry about that. Um, you know, really upsetting to see that one tree um, down on the ground um, in an area that had other trees down as well. Um, but yeah, just a big... We we spent a, a huge day really on Saturday clearing out roads and um, to to get traffic moving again, um, and um, some yeah quite exciting wind blow really, um, uh, and and then we've got other areas that have you know big big old ash trees and um, lots of flattened uh, Sitka spruce in in areas that's a real real mess. Um, so yeah, it's a it's it's a definitely a head scratcher and a. Uh, and uh, something, but uh, as uh, Ed, I think you said really well, you know, it's, it's it's time to think now. Now that we've cleared paths and and roads, uh, and everything needs to be safe, is safe. Um, we can sort of stop and take stock now. Yeah, no, excellent. Thanks ever so much for that feedback. Anybody else wishing to come in? Mark, I don't know whether you want to um, share what's happened in your woodland. Seen pictures of it. Uh, yeah, hi Neville. Um, so we have a small area of woodland, about four acres, on the north slope of Little Melfell. So um, yeah, you know, we were probably expecting some damage, um, perhaps given the forecast for the storm and its direction, because we're in, our woodland's really only exposed to the north. Um, it's not really exposed to southwesterly or westerly winds to anything like the extent of maybe anything through from maybe northwest round to northeast. Um, and we've got pretty big spruce and larch dotted through our woods and two trees have come down, a large spruce and a large larch. And they're hung up at the moment in the top of another larch. And it looks, and they both those two trees have pulled their root plates up, that's worth knowing rather than shearing off. And um, they've landed in the top of our part way up in another larch. And from looking at the base of that, that looks as though its root plate has dis been disturbed as well. Um, so we're just, at some point, they're too big for me to handle. So at some point, we'll get a professional forester in to do that and some of the other, you know, regular maintenance that we get done every year or so. Um, Interestingly, in our wood, there, historically, there's quite a lot of large trees that are quite leaned over. We've got very few trees that are growing upright. Um, and it would be interesting if people feel able to discuss to what extent the tree that appears to have moved its root plate, but not actually pulled it up out of the ground, needs removing or can just be left to see what happens. But that's probably about it for me now. for now. Thank you, Neville. Oh, I'll uh, come to, is this your name, Belle, or is it yeah. as in the yeah. place? I wasn't sure whether it was. Uh, yeah. My name's Belle. <clears throat> okay, yeah. cool. I'll come to Belle <laughs> and then to John Tunnicliffe next. Yeah, I mean, first of all, I wanted to say to Paul, my heart really goes out to you, and I'm, I'm really sorry to hear. I've got a, an eight hectare site, which has got a few very mature trees on, but has been heavily grazed. And so my plan is to plant on it. And I've just lost five trees, so nothing nearly like yours. But then I didn't have nearly as many trees. Um, and I suppose the thing that I'm trying to think, because I've got a planting plan and I'm applying for a grant to plant, I'm trying to think, what can I learn? So there's one rowan, which was on its own on a um, west facing slope, which looks as if someone's just picked it up and thrown it. Um, and it's on its own. So maybe that's the answer. And, and that's all because I was going to plant all around it. I've got a willow, a very mature, very beautiful willow, which is just gone and everything else around it's all right. And it's not a willow sitting in wet, which uh, there is another one that's gone, which I can sort of see why that's happened. This was on a rocky outcrop. There's an oak, an absolutely beautiful oak. It's not one of my old ones, but the plate is up and it's just, it's just gone. It's perfect. I'm, I'm 
would love somebody to come and do something with it. It looks like a mast of a ship. I mean, that's what oaks were planted in this country for. But I suppose what I'm just trying to think about is how do I learn for my planting plan or can I learn for my planting plan? Or do I say this is just an extraordinary event and actually more trees would give more protection and they will get thinned. But, I, you know, I, I bought my wood nearly a year ago and I'm just at the exciting point of putting in my grant. So, you know, I'm very inexperienced. Um, the other thing to say to Paul is I'm part of the South Lakes Woodlands Group, which I found fantastically supportive. And I think, Alveston, you would come in that if... if I, I'm, I'm in no position to say this, but I would have thought that we would welcome your membership. And if you wanted to, I'd get a lot of peer support from them. Um. Can I can I just give a, uh, a plug just before I go to John for our Woodland Advisory Service? So we do have funding from Heritage Lottery Fund and from the Forestry Commission um, to offer it's kind of light touch first touch advice for people that own woodlands of say half a hectare and over um, so you know that would be available to you if you haven't got a management plan as yet so that might help um, and just reflecting on your question I suppose or your your question about learning and there are tools to um, suggest when forests will blow over but not individual trees. And they're kind of based on population rather than uh, individual circumstance, really. So, you know, they're more of a landscape scale than they are at an individual small coop scale. I, I don't know whether any other foresters out there want to come in on that point about um, wind flow mapping. Stuff. Getting nice messages in the, in the chat, which I was looking at. So the root plate is still connected. Yeah, it's very, very much likely that your tree could still grow from that if you're not after timber, for, yeah. something, for example, and you don't need to clear it for anything. You could also use it as shelter for planting up nearby as well, especially if you're an exposed site. It might give you a little bit of an increase there. Yeah. Thank Other you. opportunity. So it's worth Carrie saying that Carrie's one of our colleagues that works with us at Cumbria Woodlands, so is a very experienced forester. So whereabouts were you, Bell? Uh, you did um, uh, South Lake, so Crosthwaite, um, okay. so six um, miles west of um, Kendall. And it was strange because there's, uh, I mean, one tree at the top, one at the bottom, one at the north, one at the south. You know, it, it, you can't see that the wind just came through. It just seems like someone's picked this one up, picked that one up, and they fall in different directions as well. So it's it's not, I can't see a pattern. <laughs> Anybody else want to come in on Winthrow hazard classification, maybe even stray into thinning? Ed, is there anything that you would like to add around uh, Winthrow hazard stuff and thinning and stands, I suppose? Uh, thanks. Not particularly. I, I, there's lots of other things that I was going to say, but not particularly on the technicalities of wind hazard class uh, you know there's an old adage isn't there in forestry that you you know you, you can't thin to the wind you know you, you shouldn't you shouldn't be scared of thinning I have to say I've been to look at some of the woods that I've just just thinned I've spent ages selecting trees making sure I'm, right, I'm taking those down and leaving the good ones and it's all catastrophic <laughs> they've all been completely destroyed all that good work which may to show the one-off event. Just one thing to add to Bell's comment. I wouldn't worry in the slightest about you willows. I think it's unless they're really totally uprooted, they will survive. That's what willows do. You know, they're not a very long-lived tree and they tend to collapse. So with your willows in particular, I'd be quite optimistic about them. Thank you. Thank you. We, um, we do actually have one of the UK's, they've got to work out from this introduction who they are. We do have one of the UK's foremost silver culturalists in the audience today. And I'm going to ask them to unmute themselves and see whether they will speak to us from Penrith on the topic of thinning and wind. Have they unmuted themselves? I'll check. Have they worked out who they are? Yeah. Edward, are you out there? As one of the UK's, Edward Wilson, Ted, 
as the UK's one of the UK's foremost, foremost silver culturalists. Have you got anything to add on thinning and wind and uh, wind hazard? I think you might have gone a bit bashful. No, okay, he's missed his chance. He may be coming later. John, if I could go to John Tunney, Tunneycliffe. Good evening, all. Um, I'm John Tunneycliffe, and I work for AW Jenkinson's Forest Products at Penrith. Um, I came on here really tonight to just reassure everybody that they aren't out there trying to battle through this on their own. You know, as an industry, we are here to help anyone in any way we can. Um, there's my other colleague, he's on as well with tonight, William Livesey from Stobart Forestry, who's very up on all of the woodland licensing management, felling licenses. Um, we are a sister company of ours is Euroforest as well, which is one of the largest timber harvesting companies in the country. Um, so it was mainly to be here to introduce ourselves to anybody and if they need us that we are we are here um we have every resource available to us to handle any problems that anybody's got um and also to say that i've traveled just about every part of the north of england this week and in the north of england is absolutely decimated and i'm not talking a little bit i'm talking a lot um the forestry commission have put out a statement i think today that they estimate there's over a million tons of timber down in kielder alone um wow. the says there's a million tons of timber down in kielder carry on john Sorry. Um, so, yeah, it's it's just to be here and just to say that we, if anybody needs any help at all, we are here. You know, we're a Cumbrian company and we like to look after Cumbrian people as well. So um, for everyone to carry on. But, yeah, you're not you're not in it alone. No matter how big or how small your woodland are, you're not in on it alone. But, okay. Uh, yeah. Thanks ever so much, John. What I'll probably do, and I'll just give yourself and your colleague, uh, William, a bit of a heads up to think about it now, is the next topics around safety. And actually, it would be really good to hear from um, somebody like yourselves from the contractor base around safety issues for contractors and working within Woodlands, because that, for me, is one of the absolutely key points to come out of today. Um, and if I could just build on um, what you've said about where a lot of the damage is, certainly looking at reports coming out of Forestry Commission Scotland, there appears to have been, it kind of seems to have focused in Aberdeenshire and then moved down through to Kielder and then maybe even hit the South Lakes after that. There seems to have been that kind of almost J-shaped trajectory to the storm coming through. Unless anybody had anything else in terms of their own experience, um, then um, what I intend to do is move on to safety. And I think to start off by moving to safety for individuals within your woodland rather than contracting element and what your responsibilities are. And I guess, you know, the bits that I would stress around it are, it's about inspecting, checking, making records of that, so walking the footpaths, walking your boundaries, especially boundaries that um, abut roads or bridleways, footpaths, etc. Looking up and down, looking at route plates, that kind of thing, uh, and do that as the you know your number one priority. Anybody got anything else? To, that's certainly what the Forestry Commission's response has been on their own estate. Um, has anybody got any other reflections on safety stuff? I'm really happy to come to Ed to hear what his experience is on his land, but also to others as well. Ed, well I just been, um, I've been out in the last couple of days putting some 
no entry signs up on uh, some of my clients' woodlands just to make sure that people, um, you know, just asking them for their patience really and saying that there is storm damage and these woodlands aren't safe at the moment. And please could they bear with us and just please stay out of the woods for the time being. Yeah, I think that's a really important message. I, I'd, I'd like people to also to think about their own safety and safety clearing up stuff. And I'll just come to a contractor's point of view because windblow and chainsaws absolutely scare me. Um, but I don't know, John, um, I don't know whether you're best answering that or William, do you want to? Yeah, um, I've got my own chainsaw, chainsaw tickets. I do not touch wind throw. Not, not not within a million miles do I go anywhere near a windblown tree because I will hold my hand up and say I don't have the experience. It's it take you've got to properly plan the job right from the start. You can't just start cutting and see what happens. Um yeah, that, that's that's my thing is it's if you look at it and think it might be a bit dodgy, just get someone else in that knows what they're doing. Um yeah. So I've written down three things around wind blow, why it scares me. And they all start handily with the letter T. So the first one is tension. So the tension within felled timber is both unpredictable if you don't know what you're looking at and uh, and really worrying and incredibly powerful. The next one is about tools. So having the right tools with you to be able to deal with it. So that's probably winches in various different forms. And the next one is having the right tickets. So if you look at the hierarchy of uh, chainsaw tickets, so competence tickets. Windblow stuff comes at the very top end of that, and it does so for a reason. You have to be experienced, knowledgeable, and know your limitations. Two people have raised their hands, so I'll go to John and then to James. Yeah, oh, you, you're completely right with the um, the condition of windblown trees. They are far too unpredictable for somebody who is remotely un vastly experienced to handle. Um, I myself, I worked down in the storm of 87 and in 90, I think it was. Um, I was down in the south of England doing those. I've worked as a contractor for 30 years. Um, class myself as quite experienced with the chainsaw but I would not want to be tackling a lot of these windblown trees um, what looks like a semi-secured root plate can be very very dangerous and it's not just the fact of the tree hung up it's the root plate as well which is dangerous you've got other trees that are leaning onto a root plate you cut one off the root plate falls the tree behind comes down straight on top of you um, there's a lot of trees that might look like they're stood up, um, but they are actually loose. They're only holding each other up at the moment. And it is a very, very dangerous situation to put anybody into unless they have got really, really, really experienced cutters. And 90% of it, if I could say one thing, if you can do it mechanically from sat within a steel cab, get it done mechanically. It's it's far too dangerous to be tackling wet, slippy, unstable hillsides with a chainsaw in your hand dealing with windblown trees. And that's that's just my personal appeal to anybody is don't take it lightly at all. Thanks ever so much, John. I'll come to root plates in a second, but I'll go to James Anderson Bickley first. Hello, James. I haven't seen you for ages. Really good to see you. Do you just want to make sure you introduce yourself first, please, James? Hi, 
Um, good evening, Neville. Um, James Bickley, I work for the Forestry Commission. Um, I'd just like to double on what John just said on the safety angle. I was in the Black Forest in 1999 when they had a huge storm blow event there and the number of, of professional cutters who died was in double figures. Um, I spent 10 years on the chainsaw myself almost and uh, I've got all the tickets. I've got the PPE. I'm rusty, but I recognise it's a very specialised job and wild horses wouldn't pull me out onto the roads last weekend. Um, I was out and I saw uh, over a dozen folks um, with chainsaws with no PPE on last weekend, including one individual who was up in 10 foot off the road up in a tree. And I just thought it was absolutely horrific. And I was almost waiting for to hear um, the numbers of accidents following the storm and clearing it up. So just a plea, they are massively unpredictable. Even if you've got years of experience dealing with them, the tensions are unreal um, when you've got um, timber all collapsed over on top of each other. So just avoid it. Uh, please avoid it unless you've got the experience and the qualifications. Yeah. James, can, just before I come to Steve and Lisa, could you just mention severed root plates and settling? What do you think about those? Um, was that the question earlier? No, it's just about, you know, a lot of people will sever a tree from the stem and then maybe remove the timber um, yeah. and root plates can move at some point in the future and almost like end up like a an oyster or a clam closing yeah. around somebody so you really do need to um uh pull those over and have the right kit to do that if you're working in those environments yeah okay thank you um good to hear from you james i think we'll come back to you when we're talking regs if I can go to Stephen Lisa, I think you've got your hand raised. Uh, I think my, half of my question's been answered. We, we've got, we're, we're five years owners of a very small two acre site, east facing on a downward slope to the east um, on limestone, unprotected from the north. Uh, a lot of overgrown hazel, 20 year old hazel, and the topmost hazel has tipped over and has taken the next five down the slope with it. So we've got, you know, a heap of, the, all the root plates have tipped up 90 degrees. Um, we've got lots of little ones down that we can deal with. You've answered the question as to whether we go anywhere near the five gigantic 30 foot hazels piled up one on top of the other, which is no. But we're managing for wildlife and biodiversity. We're not managing for timber. so. Do we get contractors in to chop it all up for us or do we just leave the whole mess as it is um, and assume that some sort of wildlife will actually appreciate the devastation? That, that's a really good point and uh, I think I'll comment on it and then I'll hand that over to others as well to comment on that because, you know, generally biodiversity really likes mess. And, you know, one of, the, one of the things we often see with um, people that are relatively new to woodland ownership and uh, have small woodlands is that they, they often want to garden. <laughs> and um, we kind of often have to say to people when we're working with them, you know, restrain yourself from tidying, restrain yourself from gardening, mess, dead dying, decaying stuff is absolutely, it comes back to your objectives. So what you clearly said was your objectives were around biodiversity. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, when you're talking about small amounts of, and the other thing for me that you've spoken about there is, is deadwood. And, you know, if you look at many, um, many wild woods in other parts of Europe or at similar latitudes around the rest of the globe or and some really studied sites as well they have considerably more deadwood than we typically do in British woodlands and that's incredibly important for um, uh, for driving the whole biodiversity thing you know so I don't, I, I don't know we were Ed and I were talking earlier today and we were kind of going is some of this stuff opportunity and is some of this stuff sad? And um, what's the balance between that and how you perceive that? I, I don't know, I'll, I'll hand back to Ed, just to see whether you've got any different messages on that to me, Ed. I, 
my, my favorite quote is from a Californian professor I had, and bear with me, uh, all the folk that have heard this too many times before, which is, is that the right answer? I don't know. Now, all the Americans hated him, but often there isn't a single right answer. So having debate and discussion about what you do with Wimblow is incredibly healthy. Edward. Yeah, no, I think you're right. Never like, you know, it is it is sad and it is depressing and it's easy to get despondent. And my my heart goes out to people who've 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 got severe damage in their woodlands. I've had at least two landowners in tears on the phone to me, and you know that's quite hard quite hard to deal with. But and this is a big but in red capital letters, you know, nature abhors a vacuum, uh, and this will create a huge uh, range of niches for wildlife. So you mentioned deadwood, and it's easy to say it's great for deadwood, isn't it? Well, let's drill down a little bit more into why it's good for deadwood. Think of all the uh, crevices and cracks that have been created for, for bat species, for example. Think of all the, all the um, branches and, and spires that are going to rot and they're going to be great for woodpeckers, but also for other whole nesting birds. You know, I'm not, I'm not a bird expert, but things like marsh tits, I think, need, you know, they need standing deadwood so, uh, for holes to nest in. Um, if we manage our deer population well, and I think that's a really, really important message, we must make sure we keep on top of the numbers of deer so that that allows the natural regeneration to come up in all this lovely warm sunlight that's going to flood into our woodlands. So if we manage our deer and or do a bit of deer fencing, if, if appropriate, I'm quite happy with that then we're going to get lots of brambles, lots of flowering plants and the nectaring opportunities for the invertebrates uh, that are feeding on, you know, the fungi uh, uh, and so on. It, 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 there are so many new niches that I, I really do think this is going to be a wonderful opportunity. So, yes, let's harvest some timber because, you know, it'll be a, a bit of a waste if we don't harvest some timber. But equally, there's going to be lots of deadwood, lots of niches. If your root plates are safe, then let's have some vertical root plates out of the way because they are, are a brilliant nesting opportunity for birds, but also for the insects like solitary wasps and bees and things. So, you know, um, I'm trying to be, I've got 60 trees, 60 mature oaks down in my own wood and, it, and, and I look at it and think, oh, what, a, what am I gonna do? And then I have to remind myself, sit back, watch nature take over with a little bit of help, uh, you know, I think things will be okay. I'm going to interrupt here because I don't know how to put my hand up. Jamie, do you want to just introduce yourself as Cumbria Woodlands in-house um, ancient woodland and plantation on ancient woodland expert? You've just introduced me. So that's done. Thank you, Neville. Yes. Um, hearing two things that Edward's just mentioned, root plates and uh, deer. And actually, through a lot of the woodlands that I go to, the, the uh, root plate is one of the places where you get natural regen because it's up out of the reach of the deer. So it's quite a sort of an interesting thing to see when you're walking through a woodland and there's an upturned tree. You'll often find sort of natural regen, rowan trees, birch or whatever, up out the reach of the deer. So it's a useful tool in a way to sort of show uh well help inform management as well so that's 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 one thing um yeah and i think edward you're mentioning about just time there's there's yes it's so sort of, it's it's very quick to go it's terrible but actually it does well these things take a long time and they can it, it, it'll come right in time so yes i'd say duncan davidson's comment in the uh in the, the chat section there as well, saying about it might teach us some patience. And uh, that's very true. It's quite right. It's sort of, um, yes, the woodlands have been there for a lot longer than we have. And there have been a few trees down in, in, in the past. But yes, quite, quite a lot of the time, people like to tidy up. And uh, that's why we don't see so many trees blown down uh, regularly. But it's not such a bad thing in some cases. So, yes, I think. Uh, That'll be, that'll be that. Glass half empty, glass half full. Thanks ever so much, Jamie. Which is it? 
Um, I'd like to move on now uh, briefly to look at the regulatory side of things. It is, it is important that we stay on the, the right side of the law with this stuff and ensure that we take the right steps. Um, James um, Anderson Bickley, are you able to come in and share some comments of that on that? Um, yeah, I, put, I copied and pasted the, um, the position in the comment box. Um, and I think you said you're going to send it out later. Um, um, so it's, it's being published by the Forestry Commission, I think, next Tuesday and sent around then. So you're going to get me in trouble now, aren't you? <laughs> no, no, no. I've checked that you can share it today. And that's absolutely fine, James. So maybe you could pick out the high points for us just to ensure that those messages uh, are across. And if people want to scroll up to the top of the comment section, you'll actually be able to see see them there. But any high points from that, James? Well, I think first and foremost is a safety point that we've been talking about and um, not to put yourself at risk um, and look after yourselves and um, not head straight into it. Um, I mean, technically speaking, uh, wind thrown trees are exempt from a license, but those that are standing around them are, are not. Um, so I think reading between the lines of guidance is if you apply for a license, then that is helpful because you're also um, meeting chain of custody requirements as well. Um, and that helps with certification and, and, and what have you. Um, there, there's also challenges around uh, workforce availability um, that John may be able, and you might be able to speak about too. Um, sure. But windblown snap trees generally won't will not require a license. However, those around them, and it also if you're cutting into adjacent compartments to get to a wind firm edge, um, then the license um, requirements um, are, are relevant. Okay, thank you, James. Um, I'll throw it open to the floor in a minute, asking James any really technical, in detail questions about the regulations. I would like. <laughs> Um, <laughs> Cheers, Neville. <laughs> but I'll just underline two points. I think for me, which what comes out is when in doubt, when in doubt, ask. The Forestry Commission are a very approachable bunch, so I would contact them and go, "What do you think? Should I?" And, and the other thing is, um, it's about the I think it's the fourth bullet point down of uh, taking photos, keeping a record of your discussion discussions and decisions so if you are in doubt and you are just going to do then make sure you keep notes of that and I can see Williams nodding along to that and James so any probing questions for James on regulations come on my team there might be a real bonus in it for you here you no, well, that's completely that. unfair. You know full well I don't work in our regulatory and grants team. <laughs> I know, which is what makes it more fun. <laughs> oh, look, there's two hands up. Let's go David Kelly first and then Edward. Uh, hello, um, I'm a farmer in uh, Kentmere um, and uh, my landlord has asked me to ask some questions about planning permission um, involving trees that are standing trees that have been fallen down, trees that have been broken in some way, and what we can and what we can't do regarding planning permission. When you say planning permission, do you actually mean planning permission in relation to buildings? Yeah, it's difficult to understand. I, I, I'm asking questions on my landlord's behalf. So yeah. he's that we need planning permission to be able to fell a tree, um, I don't think it means, I don't think it means buildings, no. Um, but permission to be able to fell a tree over a certain diameter. Um, so there's two very different pieces of uh, legislation you're talking about there. So yeah. planning permission is very different from felling license regulation. That must be what so means. The felling license regulation is about the volume of timber you fell in any one given calendar quarter. Um, and it's up to five cubic meters, he says, looking at James, in any one calendar quarter, if you're keeping it for your own use. And if you are selling it, it's two cubic meters. But do feel free to get clarification around that. 
Uh, you also have to think about conservation areas as well. And if it is in relation to building stuff, then it could be something to do with the planning regulations. Wills are seeing. Yeah, can, Neville, can I just say I'll put the link to the uh, regs on felling licenses in the comments? And um, David, um, use uh, one of the agents. If you're looking, if you need to fell some trees, um, uh, look to use uh, an agent or a contractor um, to apply for the license for you if it's a significant volume of timber you want to drop. Um, and that, that would that would help you through a, a process you might not be familiar with, although yeah. it's fairly straightforward. David, and if it is, um, if it's about woodland management rather than felling individual trees, then our woodland advisory service is free and that will point you in the right direction. If it's about individual trees outside woodlands, then we're not able to do that. I'll go to Edward and then Carrie. Thank you. Uh, well, yeah, just to uh, make the point, and uh, I think James will support me, is that just to make the point that um, uh, trees outside woodlands are also subject to felling licence legislation. So, you know, if you have 10 hedgerow trees uh, that you want to take out uh, and they come to more than the volumes that Neville was talking about, you still need a felling licence. Thanks for that point of clarification, Ed. Carrie? Yeah, I just wanted to highlight a classes question um, because I think it was quite important in the comments about closing public footpaths and closing public woodlands. How to go about that? Can you do that? And I wondered if anybody could comment on that. Too. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sorry, Tim. I don't feel that we're the people to uh, respond to you about footpath closures. I think that's Certainly something knows that the answer. If yeah. I may never like, you know, Definitely. putting signs on, on gates and, and saying, not saying footpath closed, but just saying, you know, please be careful, please stay out of the woodland, you know, and find a different route and, and try and stay, just stay out of the woodland because they're not safe places. So I think you can still encourage people to stay out of the woodland without closing the footpath. It's maybe a second best option. <clears throat> With regards to that, I think you need to contact uh, either Countryside Access or um, part of Cumbria County Council or um, Lake District National Park. I'll be able to help you with that. So, Tim, um, it, would, it would be the National Park where your woodland is that you'd have to contact. Oops. That's right. That's right, Neville. Thanks. Yeah, I was just listening in then. Oh. Kids, but yeah. Um, that's correct, yes. If you give us a call, um, the number, well, not my number, but the call for reception will be 01539 If you call that number and speak, have to speak to uh, Nick, he's a countryside access officer, he'll be able to give you some advice on that, about what you can do in terms of closing or putting your signs up for your, for your rights of way. I hope that's Thanks. helpful. Thanks ever so much, Tim. Yeah. Um, just, sorry, just, I forgot to introduce you, Tim. Sorry. Yeah. We've just to follow, to just, you, just. We've got, two Tims here. we've got Tim Timmerman, who owns a woodland in the Lake District, and then we've got Tim Duckmanton, who works for the Lake District National Park in the Policy Department. Sorry, Tim, go for it. Tim Timmerman. Yes, uh, just to follow up from my question, obviously, signage is very important. Does anyone know where they can be bought? Is there an internet site anyone can recommend? Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. I, I can hear, I can, looking at Ed's facial impression, facial uh, stuff going on, he's thinking about it. Did you make your own, Ed? <laughs> I, the, I, uh, I was just trying to recall, I recently bought some signs and it's something, it's something quite intuitive like um, farm signs or f farm and forestry signs. If you Google it, I think you'll probably come up with with the best option. I'm sorry, that's not very specific. <laughs> well, I'm, as you know, uh, Neville, uh, I live next door to the Woodland Trust, the, the great knot woodlands. I've been there today, probably lost about 15% of their trees. Um, but they, of course, they have very professional signage. Would they share? Does anyone know? Anyone here from the Woodland Trust? I have not seen anybody from the Woodland Trust. I, I am, so it's Rachel Penn, I'm an outreach advisor actually in the northeast region. Um, I believe that we make up our own 
um, signs that I can inquire and um, send information through tomorrow if that's helpful. Might be a nice little owner for the Woodland Trust. Mm -hmm. um, Rachel, feel free to send that information to us and then I can pass that on to uh, Mr Timmerman. Yep, certainly will do. And Tim, there's a somebody's made a suggestion in the comments box, if you can see that. Yes, I can see that too. Very okay. grateful. Thank you very much for your support. Um, I'm kind of getting to the point of thinking we're around about an hour and wrapping things up. Has anybody got any final uh, final points before they do? Ed, is this a point of conclusion or is this a point of uh, detail? I'm happy to go with either, really. But... Um, well, I think it's heading towards a, a point of conclusion. Yes, just a very small and quick point to say that... Um, you know, I still have trees in my wood that were blown over in 2005 and they're still alive. So uh, it, I didn't mention it earlier on and I meant to mention it. It's just another one of these things about thinking things through. Don't rush into things and things like willows and rowan, if they're not completely uprooted, oak, um, a birch sometimes will survive perfectly well for decades to come on their side, provided they're safe on the ground and not in the way. You know, let's let's try and leave for a proportion to carry on and provide more wildlife niches. Thanks. Incredibly important point, Edward. Thank you. Um, I'll come to another one of our incredibly knowledgeable associates, Claire, who leads on trees outside ancient woodlands and flooding stuff for us. Claire, I think you've got your hand up. Hi everyone. Um, yeah, just to give you a nudge, um, Ed mentioned that in two thousand and five. Cumbria Woodlands had responded to a similar storm with um, specific training provision. Um, I've put a link in the chat. Um, if you'd follow the link and uh, make some suggestions of further training you'd like to see us provide, we'd be really grateful. Um, and yeah, as far as trees outside woods go, I'm a bit worried about that and I haven't got an idea about what the impact has been on our mature veteran and ancient trees outside woods within Cumbria. Um, but um, I guess time will tell. Hmm. So I'm going to conclude things here. I'm going to come back to my uh, four themes. You know, thanks ever so much for people sharing their, um, their insight as to the impacts. It has been incredibly destructive, but it has also, depending how you look at it on it, given rebirth to some woodlands, that warm sunlight that Ed conjured uh, up in his words, I think is incredibly important. I will put my deer antlers on because then Alistair Boston will be quite happy. Controlling deer has to be one of the single most important things that we do if we want to turn this from a disaster into an opportunity, really. Without controlling deer, it will become much more of a disaster. I'll then move on to safety. You know, safety of the public, safety of yourself and any contractors, absolutely paramount. Do think about that stuff before you start to cut anything. Regulation stuff, we've given you a very brief overview of that. We've given you some links. There's plenty of contacts out there. And the next thing for me is, and the final thing is, what's next? Next steps type stuff. Um, it will be, you know, please do use the Mentimeter or come back to us in a different way if you think there's other things we can do. I will make a plug, a final plug for our advice service. If you do have a woodland without a woodland management plan, we can come and help you for free. Really happy to do that. We probably will have quite a queue, but, you know, let get yourself in the queue. Um, and finally, I think really just say thank you, everybody. Thanks ever so much for joining us. Kind of thinking about it has to be one of the um, most important things. And I think I'll just reflect lastly on Ed's final comment, which was, we've got trees. They blew over in 2005. They're still with us. They're still alive. They're still providing um, features within the woodland, haven for wildlife within the woodland. So incredibly important. So with that, I'll say thank you, good night, and see you all soon.